Amen. Amen. We again welcome those who have joined us on, on uh, live stream. Some from uh, in other countries even, far away. It's wonderful to be able to have a, the opportunity to minister to people that you don't have physical access to. I can remember when this wasn't, uh, <laughs> this wasn't possible. Tonight we're going to be continuing the Gospel of John. This will be our, uh, our 65th exposition of this book. We're going to be in chapter 5, verses 30 through 32. The attestation of Christ's person. That is confirming who he is. It's actually a, a sign of God's mercy that he even does this. There's no need, you understand, there's no need for it to be confirmed who Jesus is. <coughs> Nothing can change who he is. But it's out of consideration for us and our kind of natural obtuseness that God goes to great length because he knows that unless Jesus is appreciated, people won't go to him. They won't depend on him. Some people don't realize, for whatever reason, they don't realize the extent to which Jesus can minister to them and care for them, and they, don't, they just don't know. So Jesus, uh, he knew that, of course, and so he took time to expound some of these things, and we're really taking some time to go over them. Now, the, in the text we're in, the actions, which is one of the longer dissertations Jesus gave, it was an answer to some thoughts that hit the crowd had after he had healed someone on the Sabbath day. And it's rather a rather lengthy text of Scripture. He'd been questioned by the... Uh, Jewish leaders, and he's confirming that they're unreasonable. He's in like in a, in a small form. He's just showing you that their thinking is off, off kilter completely. He's going to affirm to us that he he when he was among men, he did not operate according to his personal interests. We're talking now about the Son of God. We're not talking about like a prophet, something like that. This is how far down Jesus had to come. Come down here to a state where he was God. He, in the beginning was the Word was with God and was God. And he came down into the world in a form that required that he not initiate anything on his own. Uh, that's, that's something to think about. He's going to confirm that he always operated with an acute awareness of this delegacy. He never forgot it. He, sometimes we can't go a day without forgetting <laughs> that we belong to God. He never forgot it. It was always on his mind. And his ministry will establish some th something that's uncomfortable for most people doing this. It's going, he's going to establish that the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and chief priests and all this, they were completely off in the wrong direction. Now, if you've ever had to do anything like this, you know it's not, it's not easy to do. But Jesus did it. And it wasn't like a pleasant exercise for him at all. The traditions, religious tradition, lowers the ceiling. It makes it impossible to get very high. It doesn't make any difference whose tradition it is. See, there's a, they estimate there's a total of 232,000 different Christian denominations. 232,000. They're divided into 34,000 main groups. That is a disgrace to Jesus. But that's what exists. And the, the Jews, they had their divisions too. 
Some of them couldn't get along at all. The Sadducees didn't believe there was a spirit or angels or resurrection. The Pharisees did, but they managed to get to work together in crucifying Christ. They managed to work around that to get together. In other words, tradition makes you less God conscious. Now, the, uh, the genius of spiritual life is that you live and move and have your being consciously in God's presence. Amen. It's, not, it's not theoretical. It's, it's something that's very, very real. And uh, some of us, it took a while for us to get, to get there because of this tradition thing. It, it took a while to get there. But once you get there, this is liberty. It's a, it's a freedom that is, is quite marvelous. True spiritual life goes to the heart of the matter. It doesn't direct people by rules. Children are directed by rules. Thank God. Think what they'd be if they didn't have rules. Children. They're guided by rules. They're under, as Paul's tutors and governors. They, they're under them. And spiritual children, they have to be guided that way at first, too. But when you grow up into Christ, you get your bearings, you know you know how to live. And it's hard to explain to someone that doesn't know this. You try and explain to them about liberty in Christ and, and how, you, how you live for every day, it's hard to explain to someone that doesn't know. When I was in the uh, business world, we used to have staff meetings, and they always served wine at these staff meetings. And you had to do this quick, but I'd turn my glass upside down, because if you didn't, they'd fill it. So a man asked me one time, he said, hey, Blakely, he said, uh, is drinking against your religion? I said, oh, no, no, it's not against my religion. He said, why don't you drink? I said, it's because it's against my nature. That's what salvation does. Amen. It makes sin against your nature. Amen. At any rate, the Lord's going to deal with some of these things in, this, in our text tonight. And it's, uh, it's a challenging text, but we're talking about the Son of God. John 5, verse 30. I can do of mine, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness that he witnesses of me is true. At... Uh, I love texts like this where you have to do some digging and probing and thinking. I can of my own self do nothing. Now for those that are self-willed, that's pretty tough. This is the Son of God. We're, let's make clear, this is the Son of God we're talking about. And he says, I can't do anything out of self-will. See, sin, in its essence, sin is the expression of self-will, if you get right down, right down to it. It's the expression of self-will, I want to do it, so I do it. Jesus did not, this is not how he lived. He said, didn't he want to do the will of God? Yes, but he, he wanted to do the will of God, but he was directed directly by, by God. I can have my own self do nothing. Now, he's the perfect man, now, as the perfect man, as the perfect man, he's the standard for the rest of us. He declares that without modification at all, while he's on earth, he could not act under his own initiative. He acted only with the complete and unqualified approval of God. Amen. This is how he lived now. This is how he lived. Now, he had to humble himself to be in that. He really had to come down. And Paul talked about in the second chapter of Philippians, he said he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, come down real low. But then Paul says, after he, before he made that 
proclamation of Christ's humility, Philippians 2, where he ate through 13 there. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Come down. If you're on a pedestal, get off of it. Come down. See, that, that's the mind Jesus had. For you to be saved, he had to come down. God. Now, for you to be saved, you got to come down. Amen. God had to raise him up. God has to raise you up. That's just the way it works. I'm grateful that it's that way. Think about Jesus. He at 12 years of age, he's a standard 12-year-old. Well, they didn't have youth ministers and junior church and all this stuff that hasn't worked. They didn't have this back in Jesus' day. When he's 12 years old, he didn't sit with the youth leader. Huh? Did he? He sat with the doctors of the law. That's who he sat with. And when uh, Mary and his dad and his uh, foster father said, why, why do you do this to us? We've been looking for you for three days. He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? That's at 12. My father's business. He, now, he had to humble down to, to do that. He didn't have to. When he was with the father, this was his situation. He had to uh, he had to grow in wisdom. And when he came, he was he was a baby, just like when you was a baby. You didn't know anything, you couldn't say anything, couldn't do anything. That's how he came in. That way, he had to grow in wisdom. That's Luke two forty two. He had to grow in favor with God and man, which means God is not the God of the toddler. <laughs> That's why you got to grow up in Christ. That's why he set ministries in the church so that we grow up into Christ in all things because Jesus, God is not a hand holder of spiritual toddlers. That's the way we all start out, but that's not the way we stay. We, yeah. we follow the path Jesus did. We grow in wisdom and favor with God and man. And Hebrews 5, 8 said he had to learn obedience. He had to learn obedience. He had to learn how to obey. He was the one before that that was obeyed. <laughs> he had to learn how to obey. Now I'm commenting on what the humility that Jesus had. He had to learn obedience and he had... He had to learn to drink a to drink a cup he didn't want to drink. If it be possible, he said, the eve of his betrayal, let this cup pass from me. It was such a spiritually traumatic event that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, and he agonized, and an angel, special angels dispatched from heaven to strengthen him. See? Sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do because it's God's will. Amen. Just humble down and do them Amen. and ask for strength from God. And he, uh, he had to hold in check this divine wrath against sin and against sinners. He had to hold it. He's dwelling now. He's one thing to be in heaven. He's dwelling with them now. Before Jesus come along, I mean, people like Pharaoh, Sihon, Og, Goliath, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Sennacherib. Hey, these men didn't get by before God. He brought the hammer down on them. Here Jesus is. There's like people like Herod. Pilate, how was it they survived? Because Jesus told me, I didn't come to destroy men's lives or these guys would not have been alive. I didn't come to destroy men's lives but to save them. Amen. Nobody'd heard of a God like that before. But he had to come down to do it. If those who claim identity with Christ pursued this same course of not doing anything unless it's unless God is in it, 
there'd never be any divisions in the church. There'd never be any. Division is always someone exerting self-will. It always is. Hmm? That's why all these denominations are just somebody wanted their own way and didn't like the way the other way, ways other people were doing it. They, do you see, this is right up to date. We need to have this. That's why it means very much to me when anybody wants to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This, this is not a minor thing at all. Amen. Now, um, Paul told him what, uh, what Jesus did, laid aside the prerogatives of deity. In other words, deity was like a sword, and he, he sheathed it. He, put it. he didn't use his deity to overcome the devil. He had to overcome the devil as a man. He, well, you all probably understand this, I'm sure, but he had to sheathe his deity, humble himself under the mighty hand of God. And then Paul tells the people, he says, Now, as many as be perfect, this is Philippians 3, 14 and 15, as many as be perfect, as mature or grown up, he just finished telling them, whatever was gained to me, I counted but dung, refuse. I threw it all away. Now, he, he never was an immoral man. You understand? Because during the righteousness of the law, he, he was blameless. You have to worry about persecuting the Christians. He, he thought the Christians were breaking the Deuteronomy law, which said if someone leads you to another God, kill him. He, did, he thought he was serving God doing that. But once he saw Christ, he threw that, threw that all overboard. That whole career was thrown overboard. Then he says to the people, let us as many as be perfect, after he told them what he did. I kind of a dung, I press toward the mark, I ha don't count myself to have apprehended, I haven't quit running a race. He said, let as many as be perfect, be thus minded. This is the standard mental frame of mind that everyone's to have. But some didn't have it. And here's what he said. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, there's some other competing influences in your life when you can't quite see this all or nothing view. He says, if any of you be otherwise minded, God will reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, he says, as you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. In other words, what you do know, you live up to that. Amen. You live up to what you do know, and God will show you this other exalted view that Paul had. That's a, that's a wonderful promise Amen. right there, see? So we can't, like, make people grow up. We say, well, whatever you know, however far you've come, however much you've seen, live up to it. Live up to it. And then God will show you this other and Bernie said it'll make perfect sense to you what what Paul did. This same thing was given to the Roman brethren. They had some people that didn't see things alike. They had some exalted one day above another, some didn't. Some felt you could eat meat, some felt you couldn't. There was some friction there. So Paul writes to them about it. He said, don't be judging one another. Don't you feed people that can eat any kind of meat. Don't be trying to talk the other guy at eating. And, and all the people that don't think they can eat meat, don't be trying to talk the other people that abstain from meat. Whatever you do, if you don't eat meat, don't eat it unto the Lord. He said, if you do eat it, eat it unto the Lord. What will ha happen? <laughs> there won't be much division any longer. That's how, this is how God works. Everybody lives up to their level of understanding, and they're, they're growing, and it may be down here now, but as they grow, it's like this. They come together. That's the manner, that's the manner of the kingdom. And Jesus, when he came down, that's what enables us to do this, because he humbled himself. Now, Jesus said, um, 
I, I don't do nothing on my own, but as I, as I hear, I judge. That doesn't mean he heard what you said, and after he heard what you said, he judged. That's, that's not what that means. And I think uh, there's one verse that sort of highlights this. The Amplified Bible. I judge, I decide as I'm bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. So the hearing is from God. He hears from God. <laughs> it's not that he's walking along. Whenever I hear what someone says, I judge it. That's not what he's saying. God directed him. That's wrong. That's right. Say something here. Don't say something. See, that's, that's what he's talking about here. And it's the same procedure Jesus referred to in John 8 and verse 28. He said, as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Now, of course, he had a, a keenly sensitive spirit, which is a, a weak area for most of us. And we're, all our life, we're trying to strengthen and buttress so that we're, when, when the Lord does speak to us, so to speak, we can pick up on it. We can detect it. See, if, but if, if you live out there in the fringe, it, this doesn't work out there. Yeah. Doesn't work at all. You'll just blunder through life and make mistake after mistake and be sorry you did it. Yeah. But the reason is because you were too far. You were in the no here zone. Uh -huh. You were in that zone. As I hear, Amen. see how submissive Jesus was? He waited for a word from God. Pilate heckling him. Finally, he got the word. You'd have no power at all against me if it were not given you from above. See, he heard that God told him that, what to say. As I hear, I judge him. My judgment is just. My judgment is accurate. I'm not guessing. You know, that made me think. You know, we know the Spirit drove. Yeah. I always think about this when you yeah. talk about this. The Spirit drove Jesus into the world, but he didn't leave him there. That's right. I, I'm, I'm sure that these things that Jesus told Satan might have been things that he heard. He heard. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That just occurred to me. See, this is the importance of the communion of the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians 13, the communion of the Holy Spirit, or fellowship with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1 9. Or having fellowship with the Father, 1 John 1, 3. See, that's the importance of that. Because God doesn't direct you by rules. Contrary to some notions, the Bible is not a road map to lead you to heaven. That's not, that's not what it's for. It's to feed you. It's a big difference. As those that have done some traveling should know. There's a big difference between eating and reading the map. God directs you by what you consume of Him. He directs you by that still small voice that says, This is the way. Walk ye in it. <clears throat> then He tells why my, my judgment is just, and He tells why, because I seek not my own will. <clears throat> now, I. Uh, I covered a full measure of that, of that attitude. I seek not my own will. This is inbred. This is inbred in the humanity. The only time babies cry is when something bothers them. That is the only time, and they have to get a some years on them before it's not this way. See, that's part of human nature. Whenever life gets uncomfortable for the person, then they all and whine. Jesus said, I know my judgment's just or right, correct, because I'm not seeking my own will. And if anyone should have been able to do what they wanted, it should have been Jesus, you'd think. But when he became a man, he couldn't do that. My meat, he said, my meat, my source of nourishment is to do the will, the will of him that sent me. That's what nourishes you. You should be your happiest at the end of the day. 
if you have done what God wanted. If you haven't, you've got every right to be miserable. That's why we confess our sins. Good thing to go to bed with a clean slate. You can go to bed tonight absolutely perfect. <laughs> just confess all your sins, right? He's faithful just to forgive you your sins. You go to sleep, washed, Amen. clean. Jesus didn't have to do that, of course. To clarify that a little bit, is that doesn't mean that we just sin all day purposefully. Oh, no. Right. Yeah, but see, that's covered with, yeah. if we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he sensitizes you to that transgression. So a person who says over and over and over the same thing says, I ask for forgiveness, they just lied. They're not telling the truth. They may think they're telling the truth. I understand that. But no, that's part of forgiveness is that you come away with an abhorrence for that deed. Peter denied Christ once. I dedicate that to the people that pick on Peter, you know, once. And before the night was over, yeah. without a word spoken to him, he recovered. Amen. Of course, he was under tremendous attack. Jesus yeah. told him the devil had asked to try him. Yeah. We'll never know what kind of stress Peter was under that night. It wasn't just a maid talking yeah. to him. Satan leveled an all-out assault on Peter. But as soon as Peter... He just got the eye of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. That's the end of that. And there was never another record of Peter denying Jesus. Never again. He was cleansed God. from all unrighteousness. Now I said, I don't seek my own will. I seek the will of the Father that sent me. You know, there are, what is Hebrews 10.36 says that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. <laughs> after. After. You have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So the promise comes just like it did with Jesus after he's kept the will of God. Now then Jesus makes this statement, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, that's a challenging text. Let's be clear, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. This perspective will be the standard for us all, if we can see it. You've never thought of this kind of thing. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. If you've never thought about this, this can be a very, very arresting consideration. If I bear witness of myself, now, the idea isn't if I say something about myself, it's not true. That's not what it says. Some of the verses read that way, but that's not what it means. The New American Standard reads it this way, and this is right. If I alone bear witness of myself. Or the NAV says, if I testify about myself. See, that's not, that's not thoroughly accurate. If I'm the only one, is what he's saying. If I'm the only one that testified by myself, if there isn't a corroborating witness, discount what I say. So if you, if you say, I'm a Christian, there's got to be some corroborating witness. It should be your life, that should, that should be the corroborate. It's important that we compre uh, comprehend what he is saying here. Now this, if I bear witness of myself, my, my witness is not true. This con appears to contradict, this flat out contradict what he said someplace else. He said this in John 8, 14, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. See, that just <laughs> sounds like it's just the opposite of what he said there. But he said, for I know whence I came and whither I go. So in one case, he says, if I testify by, of myself, it's, it's not true. And the other says, if I testify of myself, it is true. It's two different perspectives. It's the same thing, but looking at it from different angles. Jesus is not invalidating what he said about himself. Now, what did, what did 
What are some things Jesus testified about himself? Well, he said, I am meek and lowly. That's a testimony. He said, I am the bread of life and I am the light of the world. I am from above. Said that. I am before Abraham. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. See, these are testimonies about himself that he bore. I am the true vine. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. He is testifying about himself, and it was true. So our text doesn't mean if he said it about himself, it wasn't true. That's not what it means. Jesus said he came to cause variance. Romans 10, 34, to call sinners to repentance and to do the will of God and to save the world. See, he was testifying about himself, but it was true. Jesus declared what he had to do, preach the kingdom of God, work the works of him that sent me, bring other sheep into the fold and out of Israel. He said he was the Lord of the Sabbath and came to save what was lost, saved men's lives. He was testifying of himself, but it was true. Even our text says, if I testify of myself, my witness, if I witness of myself, my witness is not true. So he's not, he's not invalidating what he said about himself. He's saying there's got to be another witness. Not even my witness will stand by itself. This is how people should perceive him. You must know who he really is, and for in order for you to know what he really who he really is, you take what he said, and then you have to have another witness which we're going to where he's, he, which he is going to address in another place. He added this sentence, I have not spoken of myself out from myself, is the idea. When I, it, it wasn't my reservoir of knowledge that moved me to speak. But the Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. See, so there's, that's a secret. I didn't talk <laughs> unless my Father gave me something to say. Now to know what he knew and had the power that he had, that took an extraordinary amount of strength. Not to say what you what you out of yourself. Wait for the Father to give you what is said. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father gave me commandments saying. So Jesus was not the only one bearing witness. The scriptures, I'll give you some more witnesses, some more witnesses to Jesus that corroborate what he said, see. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, but they are they which testify. There's another witness. He testify of me. Amen. So I'm not the only witness. God himself bore witness. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's a corroborating witness. Jesus said, I am the son of God. That was corroborated by another, another witness. John the Baptist bore witness to him. I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. There's another witness. See, there's another witness. Here's another witness. His miracles bore witness to him. Peter said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by many miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did in the midst of you. See, that was another confirmation that Jesus was who he said he was. You had God confirmed it. You had scriptures confirmed it. John the Baptist confirmed it. God himself confirmed it. The script and the signs and wonders confirmed it. Finally, after God raised him from the dead, and that was another confirmation. You will judge the world by in righteousness by that man whereof he hath given, uh, given uh, assurance in that he hath raised him from the dead. So there's another. So there you've got four, four or five cooperating witnesses. He did not bear witness of himself alone. There was cooperating witness. Now, as you live for Christ or claim identity with Christ, your life has got to confirm your claim. You, you, you can't live sloppy. You, you, like, you can't. Some of us had to recover from living that way. We had to recover from living that way. But you got to get out of that state now 
because you can't expect anybody to believe you when you say you're a Christian if you're like the other people are. People say, well, we're all sinners. We're just forgiven. Those kind of people should just like go home. We don't have to go home, find a legitimate job someplace. Your life has to confirm. And what's more, what the Bible says a Christian is, that's what you got to be. If it says, they shall all know me, you can't be ignorant of them. Huh? There'll be new creatures. You, you can't be like a, some unchanged person. So, that's, so you, you have the same commission. You can't bear witness. So you, you can't be the only one that bears witness of who you are. Amen. There's other witnesses that have to be called to the witness stand, your life being the main one. Now, we know Jesus is the Christ. We read in the Bible all kind of statements about who Jesus was. If someone said to you, well, I personally believe Jesus was born in, in Germany. We say, hey, that's not true. He says that Bethlehem, Bethlehem is where he was born. Hmm? You say, well, Jesus, he was the, he was the firstborn son of a, of a man. No, it's not so. He was the firstborn son of a woman, the seed of a woman. Every other place in Scripture, the seed's the man, not the woman. Is that right? Amen. So I know who Jesus is by what the Bible says about him. We know what one another are by what the Bible says about us. Same thing. If you, if you were to ask me to believe in a Jesus that's not described like the one you described is not described in the Bible, I'd say, hey, this can't be true. And if you, if a person says they're a Christian and they don't live like one, it's because they're not one. That's what, that's what the problem is. So we can learn from, uh, from our Lord. We learn from this, that, uh, too, a secondary sort of thing, that we can't direct people by our, our personal conclusions. Now, personally... God does allow you to draw some conclusions and keep them to yourself, unless the person who you're telling it to can, can see what you're saying. That's something else. But you, nobody can govern another believer by what they think the Bible means. Can't, can't be that way. A, per, a personal persuasion does not have authority. It, you have a right to have one. Don't make no mistake about it. You have a right to have one. Hast thou faith? Cause it. Have it to yourself. That's if it if it causes conflicting. If it's something that's not the word doesn't say it, but you've drawn an inference that that's what it means. See. So the idea of quote necessary inference. This is just a. This is a hog's hoof. That's all it is. It's not real at all. There's no such thing as that in the kingdom of God. It's a straight-out testimony, yeah. not an inference. Now, there are inferences, but they can't be bound on somebody beyond their ability to perceive it. So you may, you may tonight, you may see things that you wish a lot of people saw, but you, you can't put it across. Well, don't try and put it across. Don't let the weight of your testimony be the thing that's, that convinces the person. You cannot speak of yourself, see? That's speaking of yourself. So anyway, there's a, something to be learned, isn't there, in that, uh, in that text? Yes? Uh, I thought on this, uh, this testimony, the, the main content here is that Christ was giving testimony was about his Father. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what he came... Jesus came to expound God. Yeah, say amen. So the, so the main content of this testimony is not like a law of how we should live or conduct ourselves or what we should do in the assembly or, or all the things that religious people get, get wrapped up in. The, the content of this testimony that he's talking about here is, is the person, is, is God, who's a person. Yes, God's amen. a person. Amen. We need to be become acquainted with God. And Christ is the one who's acquainting us with God. That's that's the essence of this 
of this testimony. It's not it's not just some kind of a standard of conduct or something like yes. that. Yes. Amen. Amen. Brother Given. I, yeah. underst I understood what you said, just in pretty weighty. Let's say that uh, we have a, a brother that uh, speaks with authority in the assembly, and he, he gives you know some uh, godly yeah. emphasis and things like that. Then how would how should we guard against that being perceived as yeah. you know? Well, he can't. Uh, whoever it is, I'll just take myself as an example. This thing may be plain to me. I would be the first to confess it hadn't always been that way, but it may be very plain to me, but I don't have, I, I can't say it like I want to say it. I can't bind that on someone else. I can't say you're not in Christ if you don't see this. What they can see, now once you see it, then you do have to, then you do have to embrace it, see, if you see it. So that's how you do it. Uh, so none of us can be insistent. You have a private view, private persuasion. It's, it's a legitimate. It may be a legitimate persuasion, but it's for for people at a certain level. See, it's not it's not for everybody yet. It there's some persuasions that demand more of the people. See, and some people aren't where they can take it in so you've got so to these people that can't you see you've got you but you do have to live up to what you can see you have to do that and then God is faithful he'll not leave you he'll not leave you there pretty soon you begin putting the thing together and you remember that's what brother sister so-and-so said see then then is when you've got a you can't put it away yeah so it's a it's kind of a nebulous way, I admit, but that's the glory of it, see. Well, I've experienced it. I've had yeah. to just stay there, and then after a while I sing. Yeah. You know, there was yeah. a fact, you know. Amen. There's not, uh, people don't teach about that very much. Of course, I remember when I didn't either, but it's very important to see that. Because a lot of uh, friction and hard feelings and malice and all kind of things develop. Because someone saw something, and they tried to say the other people had to see it too, assuming that it was legitimate. But the peop no one is obligated to receive what they cannot perceive. That's the way the kingdom of God works. When you perceive it, then you've got to receive it. Until then, you've got to think about it. Remember Mary, she heard, she heard Jesus say some things. That she, she couldn't put it together. Simon says, this child set for the rise and fall and of many in Israel, the hearts of many might be revealed. He said, a sword's going to pierce your heart, Mary. She, did, she didn't grasp it, but she pondered it. She didn't dismiss it. And before Jesus died, she knew what that prophecy meant. See, another time when he said, I must be about my father's business. See, it's, Joseph and Mary didn't. But it says Mary kept those things in her heart. She, she pondered it. So when you hear something from a person who's a person of God, and you, you know they're a person of God, and they, they tell you some persuasion they have, it doesn't make sense to you at all. Think about it. Ponder it. If it's legitimate, then God will reveal, show it to you when you arrive at that. Did everybody see that? Amen. It's a great truth to see. Now Jesus says, there's another that beareth witness of me. <clears throat> it's going to be his father. And I know that, his, that the witness that he witnesses of me is true. Hey, hey I know it's true. There's another. If I bear witness of myself... There's another, see, there's another. Jesus once said, I have greater witness than that of John, for the words which the Father has given me to finish the same, the works that the Father has given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father sent me. Now addressing the skeptics that couldn't receive who he was, Here's how Jesus took Scripture and expertly used it. 
to confirm the truth. John 8, 17. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Uh, that law is talking about a murderer being under trial and one witness wasn't enough. You had to have at least two witnesses. That's what the law was talking about. But this is the one who made the law. He says, I am one that bear witness of myself. <laughs> So he uses this text. And the Father that sent me bear witness of me. Two, you got, got two witnesses. I can tell you that if you didn't know Jesus said that, you could never read that text in Deuteronomy and come to that conclusion. <laughs> you say, that's a distortion of the text. That's out of context. Oh, yeah, that's right. You just try it, try it sometimes. Don't tell people this other verses in the Bible. Just say, that here, think, what do you think about this? So I have to read that verse. You have to have two witnesses. And what do you think about how the, how the Jesus is one witness and his father is the other witness? And then invariably he'll say, that's out of context. Well, it depends on how you define context. If you define context as textual context, but what about if you define context as the purpose of God? What if that's how you define context? See, it's a whole lot different. So the other witness in this case was the Father. I have another witness, another. There is another. Toward the close of Christ's ministry, as he approached his death, he was troubled. His death approached, he was troubled. He's surrounded by a lot of unbelief. He knows what's ahead. He asked the Father, Father, glorify thy name. Evidently said this out pub publicly, he said this. Father, glorify thy name. And the answer came back, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Amen. Uh, three different uh, views of that. Well, some people said it thundered. That, that was their conclusion. Some other people said it was an angel. See, that's another view. But Jesus knew who it was. It was the Father. That's the same way when God speaks today. Some people think, so to speak, it thundered. Other people say, well, it was a dream or it was a vision or an angel. But the informed say, it's the Lord. When Jesus cried out on the shore to those uh, discouraged disciples, children, have you caught any meat? He said, nah, we haven't caught anything at all. Well, he says, you're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Cast the net on the other side. They did. The nets were filled, and John said, he, it's the Lord. There's things that will happen in your life that you will be able to say, that's the Lord. What is that? That's your second witness. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, praise God. Many people uh, represent the scriptures in spiritual life as being largely unsupported. So they seek to strengthen people's persuasion with apologetics and hermeneutics and divine design and all the rest of the worldly wisdom. What is all that? And does it really accomplish anything? <laughs> there are people study for years about proving God from nature. Well, the nature, the scripture says that the nature testifies clearly of God's power and Godhead, power and divinity. But in the history of the world, in the history of the world, nobody drew that conclusion. The only way they knew that is God finally told them. <laughs> so, even though it was a witness, it was a witness, but they, they weren't conversant with the with the witness. Now our immediate witness we have is faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Faith substantizes, if I coin a word, faith substantizes reality. When you have faith, you don't have to have any other you don't have to have any other proof. You don't have to have any other proof. 
that's it right there, your faith. That's why Jesus could say, he that believes is not condemned. That's why he could say, that's why such firm statements could be made about faith. No one in Scripture is ever depicted as having faith that had something else they had to do. Faith drove them to do it. You better believe faith drove them to do something, but whoever has faith will do whatever. If God says, sacrifice thy son, thine only son, he'll set out the next morning to do it. That's the way it is. That's why disobedience, huh? This is always a dangerous sign. It's always, it's always puts the question mark over a person's profession. Just the same as if Jesus didn't fulfill everything that was said about him. What would you think about that? If he didn't do everything the prophet said he was going to do. So faith is the most, that's the immediate testimony you have, is your faith. That's why we are to build up one another's faith. See, we, the objective is get your faith strong because your faith is what, it's your, the eye of the soul and it's the hand of the soul. It's, that's what you get hold of the things of God with. There's another bears witness of me and Jesus. I know his testimony is true. That's like Paul said, I know whom I believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I, I know, I know. When it gets down to your, you're settled in your heart, you know. You know God. That makes life a whole lot easier. Amen. Once you realize that. <clears throat> During his ministry upon earth, God, God gave witness. He said, this is, this this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is a witness, see? I have another witness, Jesus said. This is him. This is the witness. And he spoke the truth. I, and he speaks the truth. This is the, called Ephesians 1, 6, Jesus is called the beloved. We'd say the beloved one. The, the one, this is the one God really loves. You see, doesn't he love me? Through Christ he loves you. It's through Christ that he loves you. Jesus said to his disciples, the Father loves you because you have believed me that I came out from God. See? So that's Jesus is the reason why a person experiences God. You can theorize about God's love. You can theorize about it, but the theoretical love won't save you. It's experienced love that saves you, and it's always through through Christ. So that was the ministry on earth. He bear witness who Jesus was. Now concerning Christ's mediatorial reign, God bears witness there to him. Under the sun he saith, thy throat, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. He was 189. Now that's not talking about when he came to earth. That's talking about when he went back to heaven. When he bore witness. You're the anointed one. His high priest bore testimony of his high priesthood. That's what he's talking about. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Remember we're saying, he, Jesus said, my, my father bore witness of me and his testimony is true. That's what the, these texts are saying. Here's one when he came to earth, he was in earth. There's one when he went back to heaven, and then it, he bore witness at the resurrection of the dead. He bore witness of Jesus. He said, Hebrews 5, 6, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That verse does not refer to Christ's dip, birth in Bethlehem. That refers to Christ born from the grave, see? This day have I begot, that's what Peter preached. Remember on the day of Pentecost. He, Jesus, be, that's God's testimony. See, that's God's witness to, to truth. But the truth of God's witness is seen in what he said about the Son in his record. The record. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. What? What? He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. 
He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record God gave of his Son. And this is the record. What is, what is the record? What is it? Here it is. This is the record God has given, that God has given us eternal life. That is the point. Amen. That's what you've got to see. You have eternal life. That's what you've got to see. Now that I'm in the right church, I got the right plan, yeah. I'm living for the right reason, I got the right rules. No. You have an eternal life is what God has targeted. And John said, Now I thee, beloved, I write these things unto you, first John five thirteen. I write these things unto you that you might know you have eternal life. So that means this is important to know. Now you'll find precious few people that know this. Just uh, as an experiment, just pick out like five people at random and ask them, do you know you have eternal life? And most of the time you'll hear, at the best, you'll hear, well, I hope so. I say, you can get beyond that. Amen. There was a time when I was in that state too. I was in that state too. I hope so. But then there came a time when I, I know so. Yeah. Then you're ready to live and die for Christ right. when you know so. And he bore witness of Jesus by saying he's the, the blessed and only potentate seat of power. He's the only one that has real power and authority. The blessed and only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has immortality, and he can, he can confer it, dwelling in light that no man can approach, and to whom no man has seen or can see, and whom, to whom we be honor and power everlasting. If that's who Jesus is. That's not who he shall be. Huh? He's not coming to earth to reign. He was seated in heaven to reign. Amen. See? Blessed and only potentate. Now, if you know that and you are in him, exactly what circumstance can arise where you are hopeless? See, we, we, we labor not to take this from people. Here's some people, they talk in language like the age of miracles. Now that, that's not in the Bible. In fact, there were, there were sometimes millennia where there were no miracles at all. Hundreds of years passed, there weren't any. But that didn't mean God had stopped. You can't take that from people. Jesus is the one and only potentate. He can change your condition tonight. Amen. A circumstance has got you really concerned. He could change it tonight. He's the potentate. Yeah. That's what he is. Yeah. Well, when God says that, that's a witness. See, that's a witness. Well, Jesus, uh, you can see how that Jesus had another witness. This God himself. He bore witness to who Jesus was. So it didn't, it was, I, I'm sure this was a grief to the Lord that people didn't see this. But this didn't like leave him perplexed. He still had the joy, the, God has still anointed him with the oil of joy above his fellows, whether the other people do it or not. And you can live in this, you can, you can have this. You can have this if nobody knows who you really are. But you know who you really are. In Christ we're talking about. You can still live in the joy of the Lord. And rejoice. Whether anybody else rejoices with you or not. But yeah, they'll always, you'll find someone that'll rejoice with you. you God won't, God's citizen families, you know. Well, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll close there. Any of you have want to add something before we go into our prayer session? But the, oh, I thought he was going to I wanted to mention if, if any of the young ones are not clear about some of the previous uh, teaching about personal persuasion and so forth I, I thought it would be good to mention that the, the gospel is not a personal persuasion 
Yes. The, the reality of yeah, Christ. It's a now some think it is. Some yeah. some men think it is. <coughs> but the things that are revealed about who Jesus is and what he has done and the effect and the impact of that is not personal persuasion. That's right. And so that's why we can speak about that with confidence and with power and with boldness. That's right, amen. And we don't leave that open for people's opinions and people's judgment and and, and for the for the congregation to vote on. <laughs> that's right. No such amen. thing. Amen. That needs to be declared with yeah. power mm-hmm. and expectation for people to believe. Yeah. And, you know, and if they don't believe it, they can just turn away and walk away. And you know, Brother Jake, they can get away from you in a minute of time. A crisis can arise that if you're not alert, that's the one thing you'll forget. That's how potent flesh is. So you got to walk in the Spirit and live by faith continually to offset this fleshly proclivity downward. You got this tug. Pull it. <laughs> there are plenty of people that will help it along, too. Some of them may be very, very close to you. But uh, you've, you've got to listen to this witness. Amen. Brother Jude. Just the, my judgment is just because I seek not my own will was good to think about because <coughs> men can make rash decisions yeah. based on their immediate feeling. So if well, once I, I, I'll use myself when when I'm angry I don't make very good decisions because of my mood at that instant. Mm-hmm. If I could step back and take a look at the big picture, I would be more prone to make the wise decision. But my anger pr- provokes me to make a harsh or rash decision because I'm not in a good state of mind. The same can happen with judgment. Is he says, I seek not mine own will. When men seek their own agenda, oh, yeah. their judgments are going to be based on that agenda. That's right. So when they come into a particular circumstance, they're seeking their own will. Their judgment is going to be so that that circumstance turns to their benefit. That's what seeking their own will, that's what it, that's what it means. It has to do with judgment. But that's a blessing that Jesus doesn't seek his own will. Because we, we, know, we know that this is for sake of argument. Jesus isn't like other men. He was God in a man. So this, as I hear, I judge, that's a blessing for us. Because if we got what we deserved, we would be condemned. Yeah. But Jesus has heard that we're with, Je- we're with Jesus. So we're accepted. That's right. And also another blessing is that if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. I thought of Gamaliel and Acts. He said these, he, he listed the names of a couple men who rose yeah. up and drew followers away for themselves, but eventually they both came to nothing. Yeah. They bore witness of themselves. They were their only witness. And them and their followers were all brought to nothing because it was not, the work was not wrought in God. And Gamaliel told the council, if this work be of God, you can't overthrow it. Because yeah. in that instance, there were two of them. So there was more than two witnesses in that circumstance. But it's a blessing that Jesus isn't the only one to bear witness of himself. Because those people who did bear witness of themselves by themselves didn't come to a good end. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember, too, that speaking of those that laid down their life for Christ, Jesus said, They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Hmm? Hmm? And uh, we we'll receive this admonition of Scripture, walk worthy of the Lord. How do, how do you do that? By not seeking your own will. <laughs> and so, anyone else tonight? All right. Your brother Aaron? Okay.